Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming on site at Coquitlam City Centre Library. We'd like to thank the library for giving us this space to carry out our interviews. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to acknowledge that our interviews take place on the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So today we're joined by Samantha Agtarap, who is the BC Green Party candidate for Port Moody for Quitlam. So thanks so much for joining us today, Samantha. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us, just start us off a little bit about um, your background, your connection to Port Moody, and um, why you're running for the BC Greens? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a professional engineer by training and, um, and my family owns a small business and I, we've lived in Port Moody for 20 years and we're raising our family here. Um, and why I'm going, why I got involved in politics in the first place, starting with municipal was really because I, um, I wanted to make a change, a positive change. And I could see um, that the way things were going weren't in the direction that I wanted things to go. And um, while I never anticipated jumping to provincial politics, um, there was an opportunity, a door opened. And again, it's for the same reason. I, I really just generally want to make a positive difference for people and make help make life better for everyone. Okay, so you mentioned you are on Port Moody City Council. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what have you learned um, on council and what lessons will you maybe take forward um, should you get to Victoria? Yeah, well, I have a greater um, understanding and respect for Robert's rules of order, which um, isn't uh, isn't something that I think the you know, most people don't really know about in detail, but um, and sometimes frustrating. But um, and I'm all joking aside. I think the my clear message for people um, is that we need to communicate uh, often. Mm -hmm. um, government needs to communicate to residents often. Um, we need to communicate clearly, concisely, and um, I think because I think a lot of time there's a bit of a disconnect between what people see in the city council meeting or in, um, say, the uh, legislature um, and what that means for them and how, how that affects them. And so um, I think it would just be um, better for all of us if we can adequately and accurately convey what, what's going on at each of those levels. Okay, so that's a good point. Clear mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. precise communication. Mm -hmm with Frequent. each other yes. and with your constituents. Absolutely. Okay, so you're running for the BC Greens. Mm -hmm. What makes you a good candidate for people who have environment on the mind? Yeah, well, I mean, the, greasy, the BC Greens platform um, does talk a lot about biodiversity and water security. Um, and just for me personally, the environment's always been a really key part of my work as well. And um, I've worked mainly in um, as, an, as an engineer in the built environment about around efficiency and sustainability and climate action planning for cities um, and um, indigenous communities as well. Um, so it's really it's really important to me that we protect our environment um, and balance the economic needs of our citizens with um, protect protection of the environment. I think um, there's a lot of concern about biodiversity loss, especially in the face of a changing climate. Mm -hmm. And um, nature is nature is an asset, and that we haven't adequately recognized that in our sort of um, the systems that we have in place right now. Right, so that would be some welcome changes to people who care about the environment and who understand the value um, of the environment, not only, you know, for the habitat and everything, but also the ecological services that it provides. Absolutely. Um, can you, Okay, so the BC Conservatives have mm -hmm. been kind of touting BC as um, a resource superpower. Mm -hmm. So I think their goal seems to be a lot of resource mm -hmm. extractive um, projects mm -hmm. to drive the economy. How does that differ from what you see as a sustainable economy? I think, um, I don't think it has to be necessarily an either or. I think we need to be real about the actual contributions to our economy that um, resource sector makes. I think the oil, if I've got this right, um, the oil and gas sector contributes, I think, about 4% um, to the economy. Their 4% of the economy is attributed to oil and gas. And so it's it's not necessarily the huge economic driver that we, we think it is. And 
um, coming with that is some associated environmental impacts. Um, I know there's a lot of um, push right now. There's the BC Net Zero Innovation Network. Um, and I think that's really where we, we need to go. Like BC is home to a number of um, businesses and ventures that are really um, pushing on that front, the sustainability front. And we really need to lean into that and support that because I think that is actually the future. It's more of, more of a green economy. We have our resource sector and we can still we can still incorporate that into our economy, but we need to do so in a way that is um, has a net positive benefit for, for all of us and the environment. When you say 4% for oil and I think gas, I think that's the number if I've got it right. Amazingly low, isn't it, for the amount that we hear about mm -hmm. the amount of attention and resources that go mm -hmm. their way. So interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as BC's biggest environmental challenge? Uh, I think we have a number a number of challenges coming up. I think the protection of old growth forest is key. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, little left, um, and again, for like what we know as the biodiversity of those regions is really important to preserve, similar to why we would want to preserve the Amazon rainforest. Um, and we need to balance the needs of like the economic side with with the need to preserve and um, protect the those spaces. Climate change is a big um, one on the environment where we are going to see changes and impacts to our natural environment um, based on a changing climate and not only in terms of like atmospheric rivers and heat domes and wildfires mm -hmm. but um, but also just the stress of um, warmer or warmer summers and warmer winters as well and that will change where things things grow naturally. So that brings a whole new set of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, even food security exactly. gets mixed up in that. So it's a huge one for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as your own riding's biggest uh, challenge in Port Moody, Berquitlam? Is it the same or is it? The, are there other challenges? I think um, top of everyone's mind, and at, at least in the Lower Mainland, I would guess, would be um, housing and healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, housing being the big one, we're seeing a lot of changes with the legislation implemented by the the previous, the, the current, I guess, government. Um, and I know that that hasn't necessarily gone smoothly and there's a lot of um, sort of discomfort with change and maybe perhaps unhappiness with the direction that went in. And and healthcare is also an important piece. Like people are without family doctors. Mm -hmm. I, I just found a family doctor after two and a half years of my family not having one. Um, and it, it makes it more difficult for that continuity of care. So um, those I think are at least top of mind in, in what I'm hearing. Okay, and if we can just circle back to the housing. Mm -hmm. um, are, is the current NDP government going in the right direction with housing or are there changes that you would like to see? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I think one thing the housing the housing bill shows is that if government really uh, wants to, they can change they can move on a dime. And so for me, that's a little bit of um, an indication of like the things that didn't happen is like they could have done them but it wasn't a priority, which is a bit disappointing because we have, there's a lot of competing crises here. Yeah, um, for sure. So um, the housing one, um, while I appreciate the intent, I think the execution of it was um, perhaps not the best way. There wasn't enough sort of like upfront consultation with cities um, and um, I would have, I, I would have done it differently. Uh, go back to your communications. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Communicate. Exactly. Like we need to go, and, and I appreciate the speed that it was done, but at the same time, you need to sort of ground truth it with municipalities. Um, there's some good examples of like how um, the small, um, the small and missing, right. um, small scale, middle sized, I can't it's SHMU housing, it's, like the acronym is, sh yeah, SHMU, yeah. the SHMU acronym, um, how uh, that is really just a one size fits all thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, where where properties are within 400 meters of frequent transit, so I think that's defined as a 15 minute buses every 15 minutes, um, you're permitted up to six units. In Port Moody specifically, um, there's, a, um, there's a site where on the Barnett Highway, a bus comes every 15 minutes. And so if you just draw that radius as the crows flies, um, it captures a bunch of properties. But that's not because of the steep slope and the highway. Like it's not a, it's not, it's not a, yeah, it's not a 400 meter walk. It's, it's now like 
much longer. Oh, I so, see what you mean. Yeah. So, so that isn't when you just draw circles on a flat map without any consideration of like um, natural barriers or um, topography. You, you get a different uh, sort of a different potential than what might actually what we might actually want. We don't actually necessarily want. Um, we want it to be a walkable community, but if it's not walkable, why would we add density? Like, so, right. but there's no, there's no mechanism for that in the housing legislation. So there's no flexibility to say, um, just the situation that you said, the yeah. topography doesn't allow no. for a 400 meter walkable. Yeah. Um, and Port Moody also has an interesting situation that you've got two sky train stations yes. so you've got two of those really high density areas mm -hmm. almost like overlapping they do overlap places, yeah right? they do overlap yeah mm -hmm. so that brings another issue mm -hmm. and that is traffic mm -hmm. you just <laughs> talked a little bit about transit no. um what do you what would your plan be as a bc green mm -hmm. to deal with the traffic issues because port moody you've got basically one way in, one way yeah. out. So yeah. how do you deal with that? It, it's actually kind of funny because where I grew up in um, Victoria, I grew up in the uh, town of Viroil and it's almost like the same problem. Like mm -hmm. there's two roads that pass through Viroil um, on the way to other communities and in Port Moody, it's, it's identical almost. And it, it makes me laugh a little bit that I moved to another community that oh, was, was that what so similar. <laughs> I don't, maybe un, unintentionally. Um, yes, traffic is it, absolutely a challenge. Um, but it, uh, the green platform includes free transit. So, and I know people are like, how are you going to pay for that? Well, I mean, there's ways to reallocate funding from different places into into free transit. Free transit for everyone. For everyone, because I really think, um, and then you can look at Europe as as examples. Is that when you and they don't necessarily have free transit everywhere, but the the um, the ease of use, uh, and especially when um, if you're in in um, like Amsterdam, like riding your bike to a train station, you can leave your bike there. It's secure. You get on a train. There's another bike that you can borrow um, when you get off. Like it just we need to make transit um, work for as many people as possible because when it's convenient. Um, convenient, easy, and cheaper than the alternative driving your car, like people will start to make that natural choice. Now, just want to caveat that, like I recognize not every, at this point, not everyone can take transit. Like yes. it's, um, but the goal isn't everyone. The goal is just getting more people off the roads because there's some really good visuals of when you look at people in a bus versus the same number of people in cars versus right. the same number of people in bikes. And, um, I just think those are great visuals to to imagine of like how how it can be like and especially for kids like we want them to be able to get around without mom and dad. We don't want all parents driving to school. Right, dropping the kids yeah. off, driving home, and then driving to work. And then yeah, exactly. We need kids to be able to get around safely, and so investments in active transportation, and that's like the infrastructure around protected bike lanes and um, walking facilities is is really important to a piece of the free transit part. And I think you brought up a really good point too about the um, connectivity. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to have that bike at the end mm -hmm. or have a way to get to the SkyTrain yeah. station um, to link everything together because I think that's a big challenge for people sometimes. There's where do I, okay, I can drive to the SkyTrain mm -hmm. station, but where do I park or yeah. where do I leave my bike? So still some things that we can continue to improve on. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and, and as we do that, I think we'll start to see a greater shift and it'll it'll benefit everyone. I mean, there's great, there's great um, benefits for health benefits for absolutely. active transportation too, right? So. Uh, I think all these things are kind of intertwined together and the housing come to bring back housing into that is like mm -hmm. and um, the TOD's um, development is like we need to put people where and services together where they can also access um, transit infrastructure. And I think another piece of that mm -hmm. is urban green spaces, mm -hmm. making sure that there are those trees and those natural spaces for yeah. people to go out just for, like you said, for mental health. Yes. And also for the um, ecological services mm -hmm. that they provide. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. in housing and transit. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about another big issue? Yes. <laughs> and that is, um, you know, there's an ongoing mental health mm -hmm. and um, drug crisis mm -hmm. that we've seen go on for quite a few mm -hmm. years now. And the BC Conservatives have come out and said that they support mandatory treatment mm -hmm. or involuntary yeah. treatment. BC NTP has mm -hmm. recently 
come out and said that they too um, are in support of increased involuntary treatments. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the BC yeah. Greens plan on this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think um, we, we already have involuntary care and Under the mental uh, health uh, yeah, so it, it so it exists. And I think um, it, this is kind of like building a table with one leg. So we're we're by expanding access or trying to put our it seems like all our eggs in one basket, we're building a table with one leg and we're and we're neglecting the other pieces kind of like how decrim was rolled out we we decr did decrim and then we didn't do any of the associated the support. support services that were needed to facilitate um people even go wanting voluntary care like people trying to access voluntary care is the from what i understand very long wait list so to do this without the other pieces of the puzzle is, I feel like it's going to be another experiment that's like decrim and it's not actually going to solve the problem. So um, the BC Greens and I myself would take a more holistic view of the problem. Um, as you mentioned, mental health. So in the Greens platform is including um, six, um, six sessions within the MSP. So it would add no additional charge to individuals to access um, mental health services. So it's like going so what sort of sort, like a, to see it like, like a, a yeah, to see. Yes, exactly. To see. Um, so six a year. So we part of you know any of our crises are really we got to get to the root level of why they are a crisis and um, take a preventative approach rather than a band-aid approach of trying to attack the problem afterwards um is also, it money well spent i think so way? like if you if your roof is leaking do you just let it leak mm -hmm. what happens if you just like do like a band-aid on it and it keeps leaking and then suddenly you have a rotten roof like it just good analogy. We we need to really need to like fix things at the base before they become these astronomical problems that we're seeing the results of play out on the streets to the detriment of many people. Mm -hmm. And um, just having that in the back of our head as like we look at um, what we can do with compassion and how can we improve um, everyone's situation in life. Right. Um, I think is really important in it ultimately when we protect is my feeling when we protect and um, support the most vulnerable people in our society um, we are we are going to be a better society overall that is not not only like economically just but also very healthy and you had mentioned the importance of early intervention mm -hmm. and um, you used the roof analogy. Mm -hmm. So are there any thoughts on early intervention, like at the school level, or are there any other things that we can do to stop it from getting to a crisis level? Mm -hmm. Well, we're at crisis level. <laughs> well, but, but yeah, that's true. But to maybe make sure mitigate, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, Incorporating and the, and the uh, six sessions, the mental health sessions, are for everyone. So, so for children, for children too, right? So um, and incorporating any um, you know, there's education systems and that we need to support as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, the BC Greens platform also has a universal food program, school food program. Um, and it's all connected, whether we mm -hmm. really make those connections mm -hmm. or not. Like having healthy food and, yeah. you know, being able to... Having food, you know. Yeah, right. and being able to have a consistent source of food yeah. so you're not worrying about that and mm -hmm. not going to school hungry. And Yeah, lifting people out of poverty and, and taking that off, taking at least school lunches off pe off parents' plates, mm -hmm. um, I think is, a, is a, also a way to support families mm -hmm. um, and ensure that kids are, you know, when you're hungry, it's very hard to learn. Absolutely. So, so ensuring kids have the best possible start, I think also goes along. It's one of those like preventative sort of interventions that is ultimately lower cost, uh, I think, for society than the results of what we're um, dealing with in some cases, in some communities. So we'd hopefully see more supports at the school and at the early mm -hmm. ages and mm -hmm. then circumvent these issues before they do become mm -hmm. big issues. Yeah, just, it's yeah, all preventative versus reactive. So if you get to Victoria, mm -hmm. you're going to be a new MLA. Mm -hmm. Um, you're going to be in a party that won't likely be holding mm -hmm. majority. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how would you make sure that your voice was heard and your ideas that you're putting forth? How mm -hmm. would you make sure that those are heard? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the um, things I've learned, I, and I've always been this way, but one of the things I've leaned into more um, around the council table is I, I try to build bridges. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it doesn't always it doesn't always work, but I, I really try to build the bridges between um, my perspective and others' perspectives um, to come to that sort of like collaborative point or to create a collaborative environment where we don't necessarily all agree, but there's a point where we can agree on something. Find some common ground. Exactly. Find common ground. And I would um, I would still work the same way within the legislature as a as an MLA. And then conversely on the you know on the constituent side, like I would um, I really think MLAs need to be present in their communities and and also have that connection to local government. Because I think, you know, municipalities exist because the provincial government enabled municipalities to exist. They're a child of the province. They're a child of the province. You have to you have to nurture your children. Um, and so having that strong connection back to the local level, um, to the local councils is an important um, is very important, I think, and especially so that you ensure that um, that the local perspectives are brought forward. And interestingly, and I don't know that many people know this, um, the Green Caucus isn't whipped. So that means um, we can, we, the only time, we're allowed free votes on everything except even the budget. The only um, time where we're expected to vote with the party would be on matters of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so that really means that um, Green MLAs can, um, can convey the concerns of their constituents. And if there's legislation uh, for a debate um, that doesn't suit the needs of their constituents, we're free to vote against it. And I think Green, the Green Party is the only party that doesn't have whipped votes. Yes, that's right. Yes, and I did. we did speak about that a little bit in a previous mm -hmm. interview because it's an interesting point that I don't think a lot of people are aware of mm -hmm. either. Yeah, and that's why I really wanted to just highlight that is I think it's a, I think it's um, an important departure from the democracy that's practiced in other parties. Yeah, well, thank you for, for mm -hmm. bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, anything about your vision or your hopes? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess the one thing I really want to say is vote. <laughs> right. Everybody vote. Yes. Um, and I think... Um, one thing that's in the Green Party's platform is um, proportional representation. And right now we're stuck in this system that um, has preference for the two part two parties, right? We see whether that's um, conservatives or NDP or, you know, back in the day, social credit and liberals and vice versa. You know, there's been some different iterations of parties. Um, I think democracy is better and more versus voices are heard at the table um, is better when we have a different system, but we're not going to get that system um, unless we vote for the people that we want um, versus uh, against people that we don't want. Kind of strategic vote. Yeah. We've kind of seen a trend to do that in mm -hmm. the last few and, years. And I, yeah. I totally understand. Like, it's hard to do because there is this fear, especially if there's candidates that, or parties that you don't mm -hmm. agree with and you have fundamental disagreements with. But um, until we get out of that mindset of voting against the party or candidate, we're never going to end up with the candidate that we do want. Um, so I'd really challenge everyone to like be brave and, and vote for who you do want instead of against who you don't want. It's a tough, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we have some tough choices. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do get mm -hmm. into Victoria, then we will be seeing proportional red I hope so. Come back to I hope so. Case. I really hope so. I, I don't even think like we need a referendum. I, I think we should just do it, mm -hmm. try it. You know, it, can it be worse than what we have? Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you for carrying that <laughs> torch. Um, thanks so much for coming in and joining us today, Samantha. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've been speaking with Samantha Eitrap, who is running for the BC Green Party in the riding <laughs> of Port Moody, Burquitlam. <laughs> <laughs>